Herder calls man the creature in the middle. Man has three kinds of teeth, incisors that cut, canines that tear, and molars that grind. The dental arch joins all three kinds in harmonious balance, without gaps. There are three groups of mammals, all with gaps. Rodents are incisor specialists. Carnivorous animals are canine specialists. Hoof animals, ungulates, are molar specialists. These three groups manifest the threefold bodily organism of man one-sidedly. As Wolfgang Schad has shown, the nerve sense system, the rhythmic system, and the system of metabolism and limbs. Early mammals are less clearly differentiated into the three groups. Evolution is sometimes said to be about adapting. Here we note that man is the least adapted. The human dental arch is something like a prototype. In mammals, this form is present at first, but then overwhelmed by specialization. And in general, the human form is the best reference for understanding comparative morphology among the mammals and even among the vertebrates. Sensory hairs, whiskers, sometimes grow all over a rodent from snout to tail. Their extremities, too, are delicate and used for sense perception. Rodents nibble rapidly. They shred their world as the sensory and nervous system partially destroy the organism, so do the rodents their environment. They flit about skittishly. Even during sleep, nervous shudders course through their little bodies, and they need frequent sleep. Horses Cows, elephants, giraffes need at most an hour or two of real sleep per day. On the other hand, they are permanently dreamy. All ruminants lack the fovea centralis necessary for sharp central vision. Bovine intestines measure 60 meters. They digest grass, leaves, straw, twigs, and produce valuable milk and dung. Rodent droppings are but dry pills. In other words, ungulates do for the environment what the metabolism does for the organism. They nourish it. Rodents eat foods they can digest quickly, fats, oils, starches. Carnivores eat meat, that is, substance similar to their own flesh. They do for the environment what the rhythmic system does for the organism. They balance it, namely the animal population. The extremities of the higher animals are variations on the human hand. They arise by specialization. An extreme example was the pteranodon with its wingspan of four meters. Try picturing the transitions, if you like. For instance, what would a hypothetical intermediate form between the human hand and the hoof of a horse look like? 
and lo and behold, the fossil record shows just such forms. The so-called splint bones, still present as vestiges in the horses of today, correspond to our second and fourth metacarpals, or metatarsals. Every group of four-footed mammals begins with hand-like extremities, usually with five digits, and then quickly specializes. The early mammals were also much smaller before they specialized. The undifferentiated can evolve into the specialized. Nowhere does the specialized evolve into the undifferentiated. The direction of evolution is from the universal, human, to the various one-sided forms arising through adaptation. Separation out of the original unity is the principle found in creation myths and also in physical evolution. Oaken calls the animal kingdom Mam man dismembered. Goethe says the animal runs into dead ends. The human body develops without the specializations to which the animals owe their existence. Man is related to the animal kingdom but does not belong to it. The biogenetic law, which seems partially valid, states that the genesis of the single organism recapitulates the genesis of the group. As a chimpanzee matures, it appears less human. At first it can turn its head freely, but thereafter its head sinks and becomes less mobile. The adult cannot raise its heavy lower jaws above its shoulders. This is true of other anthropoid apes as well. Also, the snout gradually protrudes. That involves the growth of the premaxillae, which in man are withheld behind the maxilla behind the incisors, as Goethe discovered. In fact, with exceptions, from the reptiles to the mammals to man, the snout develops less and less, a phenomenon of backward time. Within the class of mammals, too, the snout tends to develop less and less from the so-called less evolved groups to the so-called most evolved, namely man. The same is true within the order of primates and their closest relatives. This picture calls attention to another trend as well, the migration of the foramen magnum, where the spine supports the skull, to its human position, directly below the center of gravity of the head. More about that in a few minutes. Similarly, the distribution of hair progresses from more human to less human in the ontogeny of primates. The ridges are where the muscles attach, which as the head sinks out of the upright, need to grow increasingly massive. the animal descends out of the human-like state. All mammals develop away from a resemblance to man. Arguably, so do all vertebrates. The female remains closer to the juvenile state. A woman, for instance, has less body hair. In anthroposophical terms, 
you can say the male is more connected to the world of the senses, the female to the supersensory. The gorilla has adapted the human skeleton. It has altered its fingers and knuckles for walking. Human legs far surpass the hind legs of any mammal in length relative to the torso. The human knee straightens in victory over gravity. The center of gravity of the upper arm is collinear with the shoulder and elbow joints. That of the lower leg with the knee and ankle joints and so on. In upright posture, the centers of gravity, except those of the feet and the joints, are all coplanar, or the main center of gravity is above the feet and slightly in front of the knee in a resting stance. This makes possible our sovereign relation to the pull emanating from the earth. Man's oxygen consumption in standing is only 7% more than in lying. In quadrupeds, such as dogs, the difference is far greater, because in most standing mammals the joints are bent and the head does not rest on the spine, but needs to be cantilevered by the muscles of the neck. That is, Man is better built for upright posture than dogs are for walking on all fours. The human body has the original vertebrate form. All animals have modified it, invariably compromising their efficiency. Primates, when upright, are subject to powerful torque yet primates, and in embryo or larva all vertebrates, maybe more, are predisposed to uprightness. In upright posture, man maintains a dynamic balance. It is a bodily manifestation of the self, and it means that unlike the animal, which takes hold of its surroundings with its snout, man can face the world in a free cognitive encounter. The foramen magnum is at first positioned for uprightness in at least all mammals. The organs of balance are in the head which only makes sense if it is at the top of the body. The diaphragm perpendicular to the spine with the lungs, which are light above it, makes sense for uprightness. Lungs of mammals begin that way in the embryo, then shift to elongate along the spine. Thus the unspecialized prototype is upright, and quadrupedalism is an adaptation. Many of the bony fish have a swim bladder. It is homologous to the lungs. Darwin concluded that the lungs obviously evolved from the swim bladder. Since the publication of an article by Stephen J. Gould in 1989, it is now accepted that the swim bladder evolved from lungs. The more primitive bony fish breathed with lungs. And there are still lung fish today. Thus the centrally human predisposition towards speech would actually seem to precede animal specialization. The closed dental arch and other features 
support this as well. And one more thing, the center of self-awareness, previously working from the periphery, incarnates, enters the forehead, and develops the frontal brain, which provides the basis for concentrated thought and considerate planning. This too belongs to the original predisposition away from which the earlier forms evolved. The childhood forms have more forehead than the adult. Each childhood form resembles the adult form of the subsequent evolutionary stage in a phenomenon of backward time. Uprightness speech, and thinking, the three great human achievements of early childhood, would seem to be original in evolution. For what they are worth, the phenomena considered here suggest that evolution proceeds from man to the animals. Of course, the forward stream of time shown in the fossil record seems to show just the opposite. More about that in the next installments.